Okay, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to continue the progression that we had. Uh, but sometimes I need a breather. And uh, we kind of left off uh, looking at the bulba percussion, the Kona percussion. And then you get in some really unique things that you find. For example, uh, here looks just like a flake of flint. But this is really, I know for a fact, this is high quality flint that we find in Coshocton County, Ohio. When a flake like this is laying in a field, I pick it up and I'll wash them off later. Right up here is the cone. I can feel it, the bulb. I'm going to flip him over. And it's not as obvious where the thinning flakes are on this guy, but here's the bulb. Go to the polar opposite end. And look what we have here, a giant scraper. And even better than that is the other side. We have an engraver right here with a possible engraver right there and another possible engraver here and or here. And when you examine these, I'm going to back light this with my finger again. When you back uh, light them and then look at them with a hand lens, you'll see that these were intentionally constructed. So what I'm doing, people, I'm throwing out some new info for you. On this piece right here, this is a very obvious engraver, but if I start using this a lot, it's going to flatten down. And I think a lot of the, the uh, uh, uniface tools that you find have these or evidence of them having been there before, used down, and maybe they just gave them a pitch. So again, we're looking at the bulb real quickly. Bulb or cone of percussion. Um, flipping them around. I'm looking. I've got a bulb here that's been thinned like crazy. Thinned like crazy. You can barely feel it. Coming down to the polar opposite. Broken. This is a nice blade knife. Another one. I'm feeling right here's the cone. Here's the platform of the cone. This was one hit. Whack. Okay, and they got this great blade. A uh, little bit of thinning right here. Uh, really hard to see. They're there, but they're hard to see the ripples coming down off of this. I'm going to flip all the way down to the polar opposite end. Whoa, we have a rollover here. The energy came and rolled over and broke. But let's go to the two ends of this break. Remember what I said? Rollovers create a really durable edge. And if I go to this corner, I'm going to turn around again for you. If I go to this corner, you can see damage, use damage. And over here, this has been retouched all the way up to here to create a very specific tool. Um, okay, bulb and cones of percussion. And you get into some crazy stuff. And thank God for Gramley's book that has a lot of stuff illustrated. These look like crazy, absurd flakes of flint. But when you pick one of them up, we go back to our cone of percussion. Here's our cone. A big thinning flake here. A little bit of a thinning flake here. But look at this. This is the polar opposite end right here. And look how reshaped and, and uh, this is. Um, this is uh, almost like a, a, a spoke shaver, uh, which is basically a scraper, scraper, or a snout. And he has different names for these things, but... Here's one, here's one, cone going to the opposite end, and you have a very specific type tool here with a little bit of a, a scraper, and, uh, and here we go, back lit with my finger right there, engraver. Now I'm going to, I've got that, and I want to call it to your attention, engravers, and here you go, this is new information, and I'm calling on all of you for help. These are what I thought originally were just uh, flake or blade knives. In this case, they're long and narrow, semi-parallel. I see my cone. I see a thinning flake here. Flip them over. Look how they remove this entire arras right here. Can you see how they hit it? They thinned it and went all the way down the arras. Well, let's go to the opposite end. Um, and it's just sort of dead ends right there. But this, one of the lateral points is gone from use. Let's look at them a little bit more. And I see something. I see two pointed areas here with a lot of retouch that created these intentionally. I'm going to put another one of these right up here for you to look at. Same thing. Here's our cone. Here's our thinning flake. Thinning flake coming off of Eris removed. But look at these. These are a little more pronounced than these two. 
The distance here is greater than this distance. And I'm just going to put a seed for thought because I want to get your heads moving and thinking. If I need to have a measuring device, uh, and we all use these if you're my age when we were in grade school, and we called them a compass. You'd stick the point down, you had a pencil over here, and you could make a perfect circle. So what we have here is <laughs> the ability to put it down, like maybe on a piece of slate, and lightly draw, and you have uh, geometry to get your equal distance, your points, the things. I can turn my slate over and do the same thing on the other side. I'm just saying that these are not necessarily random engravers or inscribers or perforators. Uh, you got to look at them, but th these, both of these have been highly designed and worked. Slipping on down. Uh, <laughs> this is just laying here because it came out of my dig site last week. And if you look at this, when you're walking your fields and you see this, you should recognize it as a fire-cracked rock. So let's flip him over and look what we have. We have the distal end of perhaps the celt. I think it is a celt going on the basis of its thickness this direction. But my feelings are that they would remove the edge if they were traveling any distance with this so the edge wouldn't break accidentally. Then when they get where they're going, they can put that final edge on. Anyway, it came out of a fire pit. Let's go down to uh, actually kind of close this out with looking at uh, retouch once again. Uh, retouch can be very, very small, very intimate. Uh, it can be tiny. Uh, again, you start with the cone. Up here's the cone. It's been reshaped a little bit. Now that's interesting. This is a reshaped cone. A little bit of rethinning here. A little bit of flake removal here. Going down and going to the distal end. Looking for anything. I see some uh, flake removal here. And I see some flake removal up here. They can be tiny, tiny, tiny. Look here. Look at this, how thin it is. Can you see the retouch right in here? This is a blade. Some retouch over here. And the cone is either up here or down here. And we have to look. We have to look for our thinning flakes and, and our bulb to figure that one out. All right. Why did they do retouch? Well, if they used the flake when it was first chipped, it would be a razor blade. It would cut through leather at a blink of an eye without a problem. But it's going to wear out, and it's going to need to be resharpened. So they could have uh, done the retouch. Let's just pick this knife up. And they could have done a real mild retouch to restore the initial blade that was once here. Okay, And that's fine and dandy. Or they could have done a little accentuated uh, retouch to give us what we call this piece and over here we call these serrated points and uh, and if you just go to your kitchen look at your knives in your kitchen and you're going to see that you have straight knives with no serration and you have others that are serrated you have some with great big serrations and you have some with little and for me it's all about cutting meat it's all about cutting bread it's all about different blades, saw blades for different jobs, okay? These were both field finds. This one was laying like that. Eat your heart out, everybody. And this one was laying like this and was actually buried. And all that showed was this line, which is just not typical. And that line alone said, dig me out, except the ground was frozen. <laughs> so I was frustrated. I had to go buy some water and, and thaw the ground out to dig this guy out. So, um, I'm going to end up down here. I like to, um, I, some of you love to read. I love to read. And uh, so I have some of the same old, same old, but I want to call out a couple to you. I want to talk about these two. Um, Atavasio uh, and Meadowcroft, this guy dared to stand and face the storm. And if you think of the tempest, if you think of a ship, a sail ship, turning into the wind and facing the blast, of North American archaeology, he did it. He said, I've got a pre-Clovis site. And everybody said, you are screwy nuts and we're not even going to listen. He had to fight for what he knew was true. And you know what? He opened up the field of archaeology uh, in an entirely new direction. But I've got to come this direction. Talk about Delahaye. Tom is another guy. And this guy took a beating. Uh, his site called Monte Verde down in Chile uh, it's 
paleo on the earliest sides of paleo, which now they're thinking it could be pre-Clovis. The cool thing is they have garments, they have tapestries, they have uh, some stuff that was preserved in the clay. Two good reads. Both men stood up and made a difference. When the world of archaeology said, you're crazy, they stuck to their guns, they stuck to their principles, they stuck to their um, carbon 14s, and they said, you know what? North America, Central, South America, man, is much earlier than Clovis. These guys broke the ice. These guys are 20 century people. And uh, so you've lived and seen history made by these two. Come on down. These three got to be in everybody's library. Got to be. They talk about bulbs. They talk about cones. They talk about burins. They talk about retouch. And all three of these guys are truly well-respected men, and they've done good work. Slipping down here, I'm going to end with these. I promise I'm going to end right here. Uh, find good journals that you can afford. It might be a state or uh, a particular state association, or it might be like the Central uh, United States um, Archaeological Council Society. But these are good. Four of these come out a year, uh, and they're just full of good stuff. Coming over here. In Ohio, we have a scarcity of pure paleo sites, and I mean a scarcity. So to figure out our paleo here, to figure out our paleo here, we've got to use what I've talked to you about called context. You look at your site, and you know that your site is multi-component. It does have paleo on it. Okay, well, so how do I know where the paleo tools are? You know because... You've looked at sites like this book that documents pure paleo sites, and you look at the pictures of the tools that are coming off these sites. Now, this is heavy on Virginia, okay? But your brain gets fixed, and it can see these tools. And I look at this one, and whoa, this doesn't belong here. This is not the normal tool. This looks like the stuff they're getting off the Williamson site. This looks like stuff that are coming off the East Coast paleo sites. Some of uh, Gramley's work down in Kentucky. Uh, again, it's kind of like a spoke shaver, but you'll see it. And you'll just know that, that if you compare it, um, you find out what it is by looking at other sites that are pure. And you can transpose it over to this site. All righty. <laughs> well, it's about that time. And uh, I can't wait to shoot another video. Please remember this. Um, these are my opinions. I hope that, and I believe that they're pretty educated. Um, it's taken years of field walking, a lot of listening, uh, listening, listening, listening to speakers, conferences, uh, reading, 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 and a lot of walking that's brought these opinions forward. And I'm speaking about North Central and East Central Ohio. Um, so keep that in mind when you're trying to figure your stuff out. Thanks for coming. See you soon.